Before we, we begin, I want to give thanks to Valerie Filmus, who's been our chef with a number of excellent meals this year. And uh, Gladys and others have helped with setting up the table, so thank you so much. And I also want to give thanks, uh, special thanks to Raul Guevara, who's helped with the technical end of our Lunch and Learns. And I believe he's, he's handled probably 150 or so Lunch and Learns over the years. And uh, kind of sad that this is going to be the last one he's doing before he goes into retirement. So he did help earlier today. What? Oh, he can come back as a guest, but I'm not going to ask him to help set things up. That is going to be sweet. Oh, you're over there. <laughs> and also, uh, also uh, as the last uh, Lunch and Learn of this season, I want to thank again Judy Hirschberg, who's been my mentor, and after she handled this for many, many years. So thanks again, Judy. And, and in terms of, uh, thanks. And one last thanks I want to give is to Charlie, who's uh, filming for CCTV. They filmed several of our recent talks. Uh, they're available on the CCTV website. So for folks who have, who have missed the last uh, couple, uh, you can search there. Uh, there was the, a talk, uh, uh, there was one that was on the Yiddish Book Center, and then there was a talk on Henrietta Zold. Uh, both of those are, are up, and hopefully this one will also be up. Uh, if you have any friends who especially live in the Montpelier or Barry area, they might be interested in taking a look. So uh, before uh, our speaker, Dr. Carol Harris Shapiro, uh, speaks about the Jewish heritage of Barry, Vermont, I uh, should note that her talk is based on information she's gathered from interviews, books, articles, and genealogical research. Uh, Carol Harris Shapiro is a rabbi and also a professor emeritus at Temple University in Philadelphia, where she taught for over 20 years in the university's College of Liberal Arts. She's also been a half-time resident in Barry, where she has been involved in historical research for the Vermont History Center. She's also volunteered with the Central Vermont Adult Education. And uh, she indicated that she will be doing volunteer work as a docent. Is that true at oh, Ethan yeah, Allen Elmstead? Yeah, I started you started that, which is a great place. I love going down there and walk there frequently. And finally, Carol told me that she and her spouse, John, enjoy hiking with their two, two toy poodles, who have the quite interesting names, and you can ask Carol about their origins later, unless she wants to mention it, but the, her poodle's names are Dalai Lama and Lucy Fur. So at, though also, I should note that uh, I'd ask you to hold questions until the end of her presentation, uh, there'll certainly be plenty of time for a Q&A at the end. So with that, Carol. Okay, first, can everybody hear me? Yes. Good, okay. So the first slide points out that although um, we can say that some people have forgotten, and I'm going to talk about this in a second, that there was a Jewish community in Barrie, Vermont. Uh, I put quotes around it because, of course, a lot of people haven't forgotten that, the descendants of the, of the Jews who live there. Um, and uh, certainly there are some historical records related to Beth Jacob in Montpelier. Uh, but I'm going to explain why I would use that term. But before that, let me ask you, how many people have ever been in Barry? Okay, went down for the granite stuff, maybe. Okay, so let me go ahead and explain why I use the term forgotten. So where we live in Barry, we have a wonderful neighbor 
and her significant other, who is uh, reaching his 81st birthday, said when we were kind of hanging out together, I never knew there were any Jews in Barrie. And so this is a gentleman who owned an automobile repair shop. He was not a hermit. So you have to wonder, why didn't he know that? And I have had a follow-up. Uh, there was a uh, gentleman, uh, Alan Rubel is here. His father, Ben Rubel, opened up the uh, Barry uh, paint and wallpaper store. And I had mentioned that to my neighbor's uh, friend, and he said, Ben Rubel was Jewish? I never knew that. That might explain a lot. Uh, when we first encountered Barry, we were staying in different places in Vermont, and we actually had an Airbnb in Barry. And we were surprised because we had never heard of a Jewish presence in Barry to find that there was a mezuzah on the door. And that got me thinking, were there, was there a Jewish presence in Barry? And we're going to explain the mystery mezuzah and the mystery family behind it in, later in the talk. Uh, I also began to research, and there were, in the 1970s and 80s, and I think this is before a lot of the fantastic um, resources that were available now through Ancestry and newspapers.com and so forth were really available to people. People, there were articles saying, I think there was a synagogue maybe in Barry, but I don't, you know, who knows what the name was? And there was lots and lots of articles that were like, maybe there was something there? So that got me intrigued. And uh, I also had a real interest in finding out more. Certainly, I knew this wasn't going to be a big community uh, because of the aspect of the triple galut, OK? So galut, diaspora, of course, refers to living outside of the land of Israel. And I see this as a kind of a triple galut community. So from Israel, outside of Israel, is one galut. From Eastern Europe, and the intense Jewish life in uh, especially, as we know, uh, the Kovno area where so many Burlington Jews came from. And so settling in the United States, second Galut, and the third Galut, as we will see, from Burlington often to Barry. So this is an interesting community, but a community that has its sources here. Now, why was I interested in that experience? Because I grew up in a neighborhood where pretty much everybody was Jewish. And our plumber was Jewish, our electrician was Jewish, all my teachers were Jewish, all the kids at school were Jewish. And it wasn't even until high school that, and that was 50% Jewish, uh, that I even encountered people in my classes who were Christian. So. My world is, I mean, I, don't, I was the exact opposite of Barry, but my world growing up was extraordinarily different. And that attracted me as well. What was it like to be this very small minority, even outside of the little Jerusalem experience in Burlington? So I'm going to take you through a little bit of my research questions as I go, but I did want to point out some of the sources. Uh, Vermont History uh, Society, the center, uh, which is literally right down the street from where we live in Barrie, has wonderful access. So I had a whole lot of fun with Ancestry.com, Newspapers.com, especially the super chatty Barrie Daily Times and the Barrie Evening Telegram. They loved their human interest stories. Uh, and there's tons of them on the Jewish residents of Barry over the years. Uh, there was also a Barry Ethnic Heritage Studies Project where they recorded people's interviews in the late 1970s of some of the very earliest Jewish residents of Barry who, I mean, they're, they're being interviewed in the late 70s and they were in their late 70s. So these were people who grew up in Barry right around the turn of the 20th century. And that is an incredible resource. And the Leahy Library there has these recordings, if anyone is at all interested 
in Barry or Montpelier Jewish history. And I'm only going to be giving you a tiny bit of this material today. Uh, Beth Jacob did their own histories uh, and Beth Jacob in Montpelier. And because the congregations, which we'll talk about, end up merging in 1964, and there were also, there's a lot of Barry uh, Jewish residents who would go to Montpelier for various events, services, and so forth, they have some material. Uh, the thing they have the most of are minutes from their sisterhood. Uh, and that is m very, very late in the history of Barry's Jews, but it really does have quite a bit of information. Um, Russell Belding is a historian in Barry, and he has done two massive books on businesses on Main Street and Barry, and how they changed and who owned what. And considering how many Jews were merchants, there was a lot of history that came from there. And then uh, books about Burlington that helped me understand the larger context of Jewish life in Vermont. Interviews uh, with um, Zizi Raskin, who I hope you all know, and her sister Rivka living in New York, also, um, Alan Rubel, who is here, who kindly gave me some major time uh, talking about his life growing up as a Jewish resident of Barrie. Uh, I am always on the lookout for more interviews. Any photographs of the congregation doing things would be fantastic. Uh, Barrie was, newspapers were super chatty, but photographs was not their forte. Uh, and there's other areas still for me to explore. So I consider myself in the middle of this. I don't know what I'm going to end up doing with it. I don't know whether I will publish an article or publish nothing. But I thought I'd share with you what I've got. OK. So I wanted to give you two Burlington-related stories about residents of Barrie. And then finally, a story about the family and the mystery mezuzah. So Harry Siegel, Harry A. Siegel, is going to be one of our stories. And he came to Barry before 1900. And we're going to be talking about his life uh, as a Jewish entrepreneur. Uh, we are going to be talking, I should have put Abraham and Rachel Popak, who are the grandparents of Zizi Raskin in Chabad in Burlington. And um, they came sort of in the middle timing. And then the people I'm going to talk about with the mystery mezuzah are sort of at the end of the um, organized Jewish communal life in Barry. Uh, and so we're going to be seeing different kind of uh, people, but also different slices of time uh, in the community and how it changed and altered. OK. Harry Siegel was a very interesting guy, to me anyway. Uh, he was um, the son of James Siegel. By the way, these names very creatively altered by choice. James, apparently, his born name was Zorach. So these were choices people made. And sometimes it threw me a little off, as I'll talk about uh, in a bit. His father uh, was an early resident of Burlington, Jewish resident of Burlington. I think he came here in 18. 1990, maybe a little bit earlier than that. Yes, there I have him here. And um, his son, Harry, was born in 1871. Uh, so he came as, as an, an older person, not as a, not as a, a small child. Uh, and uh, he began as a peddler, as so many Jewish uh, residents did. Uh, and he had actually settled in Barrie around 1893, 1894. His brother saw the opportunity here, opened up a clothing store, and from then on in, Harry Siegel was very, very much involved in the commercial life and the social life and uh, the Jewish life in Barrie. Uh, and one of the things that was very hard to figure out for me was this dizzying array of partnerships and breaking up and new partnerships. I would love to talk to somebody who knows about how businesses worked at the turn of the 20th century, because there were bankruptcies that he seemed to bounce back from with more money, kind of like a former president, maybe. I don't know. 
Um, so it was, and I'm going to show you why this is a little bit puzzling. Okay, so here is an advertisement. Look out for the engine. I have no idea what the engine is. Another piece I have to look out for, but, um, and you will save lots of trouble for yourself and your family with good, warm, healthy clothing, shoes, rubbers, footwear, headwear, handwear, underwear, and sockwear. And uh, if you notice, this is called the Union Clothing Company. Uh, and uh, this is really interesting because of, of Barry and because of the union. And I want to just, I'm sorry, I'm going to flick ahead, see if I, oh, this did not come through. All right, I didn't think it did. Oh, there it is, I skipped. Why Barry? And this is where I need to go back. Barry was a boom town, okay? Uh, after 1880, when trains connected up the granite mines with larger horizons, uh, the granite industry really drove an incredible um, growth of Barry. So, 2,000 people approximately in 1880 to 6790 in 1890 to 10,000 in 1894. That's opportunity. And people, of course, were coming, uh, the Italians, the Scots, uh, uh, French Canadians eventually, a whole bunch of people were pouring into Barry for the opportunities. Uh, they uh, all needed clothes, especially if they're working in the granite industry. It was very interesting that there was a lot, those people who know about Barry history know that the Italians came um, in their region in Italy where there was a lot of anarchism, there was a lot of uh, political organizing, uh, and uh, it was quite the brawling community. And in this turmoil, a very exciting kind of community, the Jews saw their opportunities to build and grow businesses. It was much more dynamic, uh, both here and then uh, more in the 40s than Montpelier was. So, you know, Jews are gonna be gravitating towards the business opportunities. Okay. Uh, so as you see, he was gonna call this the Union Clothing Company because unionization was such a big thing. And if you wanted to get the granite workers into your store, calling it the Union Clothing Company, there was no, you know, it was a positive thing. Uh, there were other union shops at the time. That, this is in 1902. In 1903, he's a partner in something called the Blue Store, and he is a partner with Thomas Brady and Meyer Levin, who was another early uh, resident, Jewish resident of Barry. Now, Thomas Brady puzzled me initially, because I'm like, Thomas Brady? Wow, that's early to have a non-Jewish partner. Oh no, Thomas Brady was Jewish. So for me, it was always like, wow, so integrated. And then, no, Thomas Brady was actually his brother-in-law. So it was always a bit of a puzzle, you know, to try to figure it out. These guys got really creative in their English names. Okay, and we're gonna go through here. 1905, now it's a different store. Meyer Levin is out and now it's Seagulls and Brady's. Okay, so some very humorous personal stories. Well, not all humorous, but a couple are pretty humorous. Um, in 1902, there was an advertisement in the Burlington newspapers that Harry A. Siegel in his store had managed to obtain uh, a key. This is in the Union Clothing Store. Managed to obtain a key said to open the gates of Ramses when Jews were fleeing from ancient Egypt. <laughs> so it, they were inviting everyone to see this very special key that he said he got from a Boston museum. Okay. His brother-in-law, Thomas Brady, also did some pretty remarkable things in terms of advertising. Uh, after they split up their partnership, he threw 
uh, free bundles of clothing out of the second store window of his store to an ang a happ happily you know, waiting crowd uh, to, as a come on, a gimme for people to come into the store and actually purchase. Um, he was actually arrested in 1906 after the dissolution of his partnership with his brother-in-law because Siegel, uh, Harry Siegel had gone into his brother-in-law's store and created such a ruckus, probably about money owed, that the police had to be called. So yeah, don't go into business with your relatives. Um, he was also very uh, connected with the Jewish life in uh, elsewhere. So when a Polander got arrested in Chelsea, it was Harry Siegel who went and translated for him. Uh, so he was kind of, he represented a Jewish ambassador. His, unfortunately, in the sad part of this, his daughter Bessie had died at age 11, and there was a tremendous amount of material about that, when she was sick, when she passed, when you know she was buried in Burlington, so the funeral, and there was quite a bit in the newspapers about that. Um, I also want to talk a little bit, now he wasn't just a commercial entrepreneur, but as before 1900, he, Harry Siegel had invested in a tenement building on Washington Street, and this points out another impact the Jews had in Barrie, not just the commercial uh, store owning, which was enormous, but in terms of real estate. So uh, the real estate investment was, was huge. In fact, there's an arcade block, which is a, a, you know, a large block of um, uh, commercial space below and apartments above, was actually built by an L. Ginsburg of New York City in 1906. And in the arcade block was the arcade store with the Jewish manager, M. Oppenheimer, and it didn't succeed and he ended up uh, selling the block. Uh, the Yetz, whose home base was Montpelier, but uh, also uh, lived in Barrie, uh, had a huge amount of real estate to the extent that in 1922, when Harris Yet passed, one of the things they said in the, uh, in the obituary was that he had owned an enormous amount of real estate. In 1925, uh, there is a column called Talk of the Town in the Barry Daily Times, and in that uh, they hinted at someone who owned a lot of real estate, and that someone would have probably been his heir the Yetz heir. So we have to remember that both, you know, the real estate piece was enormous, even though it was not as well documented in many ways. Uh, I mean, there would be, you know, if I looked at land records and so forth, and that's something that I could be doing. So he ended up staying in Barrie about 20 some years, and he ended up moving in 1912. Uh, and this is something that is very common, this sort of 20-year time span of living in Barrie and moving on. Uh, this is a common theme, and there are reasons for this. Uh, Jewish presence, Jewish life, especially Jewish education for their children was limited. Um, Jewish mates for their children, extremely limited. And that was something they were concerned about. Um, it's almost incestuous, the people who married who. It was the same families literally kind of marrying one another because there wasn't a lot of choices. Uh, and of course, business upturns and downturns would make an enormous difference here. But we're going to see there's sort of that 20 year span, and then there are managers of Jewish stores who came in for two years, three years, five years, just to learn the business and then go places where there are more Jews. Okay, now this was just a fun story that I wanted to point out. Um, this poor girl, Russian Jewish, ended up, she thought she was going to Waterbury, Connecticut, where her family was, ended up in Waterbury, Vermont. And uh, it was, okay, 
uh, it says that uh, she was also from Kovno. I think like every every Jew from Kovno and the environment ended up in Vermont. This is my 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 theory. Uh, and uh, Harry Siegel was called to the station, and after conversing with her, found that she did not have money enough with her to buy a ticket to Waterbury, Connecticut. So he was helping her out to get to the right Waterbury. Um, so he was the guy who was called on. He also, by the way, contributed to the Hebrew Free School here in Burlington. He still had strong ties. Okay, How much integration did Harry A. Siegel have in Barry Jewish life and Barry life in general? Interestingly, class mattered. Okay, he was um, not a poor man. He had bought a substantial home. And the Barry newspapers were very interested in his comings and goings, his social life, uh, as you would with the upper crust. Now, this is not true of all the Jewish residents. Uh, some of the residents who were poorer, who were less you know, up there in terms of status, did not get that kind of coverage. So Harry Siegel was sort of like, I don't know, uh, an interesting, almost exotic figure. Uh, and everything that he did, his parties, his, you know, when he went to a funeral, this was mentioned in the paper and so forth. Um, and I do think there is something, um, and I just wanted to throw this out there as a concept. There, you know, Malcolm Gladwell wrote about this concept of a tipping point. Uh, and a tipping point, when I think about minority populations, is when it goes from people being a curiosity to more and more of that minority coming in, and then they're perceived as a threat. There were never enough Jews in Barrie to be a threat, not a real threat, not seen in scary or negative ways. But the treatment of the Jewish community in Barrie was almost an exotic, like a little spice in the Barry life, at least according to the way the newspapers dealt with it. And they were the same way with the extremely few African Americans who were part of that community. And even, yes, we had Chinese laundrymen. And so that was also treated, I think, very humanely. And I think it's because this was not, there were too few people to really get anyone terribly upset, certainly around the turn of the 20th century. Um, so he seemed to have done most of his business with other Jews, um, <laughs> even negatively. Lawsuits were brought against uh, he and his brother-in-law, Thomas Brady, by Elias Speer, who was an early Jewish resident of Burlington. Uh, he did have an Italian partner at one point, but mostly it was his business relationships were all with other Jews. And since Jews went to law a lot, I don't know if that was a benefit particularly, but that's what happened. Um, and he does seem to have had some connection with larger groups. So, for example, in 1910, Mrs. Harry, you know, they don't have first names. No, no women had first names then. They were always Mrs. the husband was on the refreshment committee for a Saturday annual picnic of the Foresters of America. So clearly not Shabbos observant, unlike some of the other earlier immigrants to Barrie, and clearly if you're hanging out with the Foresters of America, you are probably the only Jewish family doing that. Okay. The Jewish community at the time, there were a handful of families, the Goulds, the Gottlers, Kowalskis, and others. Uh, I have tried to track it down, but again, there's a huge churn in um, Jewish life. Uh, so try, you know, it isn't like people came and stayed. They often came and left very quickly. So at any one time, right around this time period in the 1910s, there were about 10 or 12 Jewish families. Holidays were spent often in Burlington or Montpelier um, with family or uh, at the Siegel's home or at the Gould's home. Uh, the Goulds may have owned their own Torah. Actually, it would have been the Sirkins who, start, who owned the Torah to start with. And we're going to talk about where that Torah ended up. Uh, in 1911, there were 11 families, according to the Barry article, that were looking to start a congregation. And they try to hire rabbis. And I put rabbis. Th th these people. This was at a time where a rabbi was a learned enough Jew to um, to be a shochet, 
to, you know, to kill chickens, basically, uh, that were kosher and also to educate their sons. So if we take it through here, Barry Hebrews, of course, ask a New York man to come and take charge. A largely attended meeting of local Hebrews was held at the home of N. Gottler of Seminary Street which to consider the idea of securing a resident rabbi for Barry. So the idea of having their own resident rabbi, their own community starts way earlier than it actually developed. And Phil Gilbestrom of New York City was uh, engaged. He didn't stay long. The previous guy, Elfenbein, didn't stay long. And part of it was, do you really want to live in Triple Galut? And part of it was money because when you have 11 families, it, you don't always get paid enough to live on. Okay, so the Beth, Beth Jacob Synagogue building. Uh, in 1908, 10-year-old Jacob Yet uh, in Montpelier, he died in a freak accident when an icicle literally bashed him in the head. The Yet family wanted to develop a synagogue in his honor and uh, had Beth Jacob, uh, his, the boy's name, of course, Jacob, uh, and that was built in around 1913. They also wanted to create a joint uh, congregation with Barry people, and the idea that this would serve both communities with a mikvah, very important back then, of course, and a shochet, okay? But this was a less positive solution for the Barry residents. And first, let me just, um, this, I'm sorry it's so wrinkled. You can find this online when it's not wrinkled. I should have done it that way. But let me um, read through just a couple of these sections. All Jewish, oh, here it is. All Jewish residents of Montpelier and Barry have to come to Davin on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. This is 1912 in the shul in Montpelier in order that there is enough money coming to pay for someone to lead prayers on the High Holy Days. By the way, this was originally Yiddish. This is a translation. If for some reason someone has to go to another city, they have to pay their share anyway, i.e. as much as the congregation should decide. Uh, and then uh, they were also supposed to uh, support the shochet, again, for the same reason. Uh, every member must pay dues of 50 cents a month. Wow. The members should live well with each other. They should be trustworthy members. If someone has something against someone else, they have to resolve it in a good way and not fight. And if they can't resolve it without fighting, they have to come when the trustees are sitting and they have to listen to what the trustees tell them, and then there will be peace. I have to say, some of the um, more interesting articles were actually not about the community in Barrie, but um, I actually found a great article in a Burlington newspaper about police being called when two Jews after services got into a fist fight in Burlington about who actually led services better. So this warning about getting along was important. Finally, these rules have the same strength as all rules of the Knesset Haggadolah, the great assembly, and someone who will not obey them is likened to someone who is breaking down the fence and a snake should bite him. <laughs> I think it's time to change OZ's rules to put this in. Anyone who will keep these rules will have blessings of good. Okay, well that all sounds like it's done and dusted. The Barry residents will come and it's all delightful, but yeah, there was a bit of a problem. Let me go. Okay. So the problem is that how much can you go to Montpelier when you're Shomer Shabbos? People were smushed together. And you couldn't even do it on an annual Shabbos. You're going to, I mean, it's nine miles. People didn't have cars. And even if they did, mud season would make that impossible. Uh, they would often go in horse and wagon. And they would have to, every time there was a holiday, a major holiday, they would have to go and they would have to bunk in with relatives. Uh, and the memories were the kids would sleep five or six crossways in a bed. Um, the women would have to bring food and utensils so they could cook so it wouldn't be a burden to their relatives. 
And this is not something that wore well. I mean, it's kind of fun for the kids. They have a good memory of that. But that whole squeezing in. Uh, when Yom Kippur, one of the interviewees remembered as a child, they would leave after Ni'ila and they would have the horse, the wagon, and a little lamp in front of them to make the journey back to Barry. So, yeah, um, the Montpelier residents could hang pretty and they have to open their homes and the Barry residents were always schlepping. And the always schlepping is not necessarily a positive. Okay, so from here, this is why they were interested in starting their own group as early as 1910, 1911. In the 1920s, you have a bit of a boost of the population. Um, like I said, Harry Siegel left at the age, you know, left in 1912. You have more people coming in. Um, and uh, we spoke about some of these, that there was not a generational. Um, the Goulds stayed. There were a couple of families that stayed, but a lot, there was a lot of churn. Okay. So talking about moving on in time, here is a picture of Rabbi Avraham and Rochel Popek. And I've seen it spelled P-O-P-O-C-K and P-O-P-A-C-K. So I am not um, going to say which one is the better rendition, but both have been used. And these folks were very important in the next stage of Barry Jewish life. Okay. Um, unlike a lot of the Barry Jewish residents, you could call this, Barry is sort of like a suburb of Burlington. Everybody came from that Kovno area. They started out in Burlington and then they found their opportunities in Barry. This was a very different story. Um, both of them came from uh, the Ukraine and they uh, arrived here. Uh, I've heard different, it's right around this time, 1915, 1916. Um, and Avraham was learned. He studied in a Lubavitch yeshiva. He was definitely a member of the Lubavitch community. And um, he ha they actually started out in what was then Turkish-controlled Israel. They had moved from Russia to um, to the Holy Land, as it were, and his first job was as a shochet on a boat that went from Haifa to Alexandria. Why do you need a shochet on a boat? Because there was no way to freeze food. So you put the live chickens on the boat, and along the way, if you wanted chicken, somebody had to shut it, check and make sure it's kosher, so you could have chicken as you traveled. And his wife and his children stayed, you know, in, it was, I believe he was in Yafo. In any case, um, that didn't work for very long. Um, and they ended up, he ended up going first to New York and he was a shochet there. And the story goes that he got a job as a shochet and he shechted a, a chicken and examined it and said, no, this isn't, this is treif, this is not kosher. And the, his boss said, that's funny, because for three straight years, we've never encountered a chicken that wasn't kosher. So yeah, being an honest shochet has its problems. So he was fired, and he was looking around for a job, and he wandered into a Lower East Side bookstore, and the guy says, oh, I have a leave for you, but it's going to cost you five bucks. And apparently he was staying with an uncle at the time, and the uncle's like, oh, God, yes. Get the shlemiel off my hands, you know, or shlemazel, depending on how you look at it. Gave him the five bucks, but not trivial back then. And the lead was they were looking for a shochet and a Hebrew school teacher in Barry. So off he goes up in New York City, up from New York City, gets off at White River Junction, is taken up to Barry, and starts his life there and his life of his family. Um, and he tried to make a living as a shocha in Barry and Montpelier and a Hebrew school teacher for the kids after school. It wasn't enough money. So the Barry resident said, hey, think about opening a business, which he did. His wife, Rachel, opened up a dry goods store in their home for the farmer's wives. And part of the property they purchased, they ended up leasing to a gas station. And uh, they did not do badly. 
They did not do badly. He, was con he went out and peddled goods. She w and her daughters were responsible for the store. They had seven children, and they stayed until 1940. So what were the experiences like for this Lubavitch couple and their rather large family in Barrie between 1917 and 1940? Well, Rochel, according to Zizi and her sister Rivka, had very good memories. She liked running her own store. She liked buying. She liked the interaction with the farmer's wives. She liked the fresh air because after this, they moved to New York City where fresh air would not have been that available. She liked the rural life. Um, and, um, but there were two children who actually talked about their experiences in articles in the 1980s. Uh, one, Shmuel Isaac, who is the father of Zizi, had very good memories of Barry. He um, stayed in Barry through eighth grade. He then went, uh, lived in both Boston and then in New York, uh, going to, you know, a yeshi getting a yeshiva education. Uh, he had his bar mitzvah in Barry in the Red Men's Hall. I always feel very non-PC calling it that, but that is what it was called. Um, it was the bigger hall that you could rent for bigger occasions. Um, and he was the son. So whenever they went up to Burlington for services, he would go up. Um, and, you know, he also got real well along uh, with his classmates. There was a gentleman who wrote Memories of Barry by the name of Richard H. Blow, and he was writing about the 1920s. And he remembers the Jewish the few Jewish classmates he had very fondly, and he was one of them. Uh, he did run into a little bit of problems. He always had to have his head covered in school, and of course that's an invitation for all the kids to knock off the hat you were wearing. Uh, but it was more that kind of thing than anything he felt was really major. Sylvia was the daughter, and she had a very different set of memories. She was caught between two worlds. Um, she had to mind the shop. She went to school, but all of her friends were Christian and she um, couldn't go to things at the school like Friday night uh, games, things like that. Uh, she felt very stifled. Every time there were services, she never went to services at Beth Jacob or Burlington because as the oldest daughter, she had to stay home and take care of the little ones. So she never got a Jewish education. And Zizi said this was before the Beis Yaakov schools were available uh, for Lubavitch girls. So she really felt like her father didn't care, it was just a girl. And she was also put in school very, very young, too young. Uh, two years younger than anyone else. I think they, they enrolled her in, in kindergarten or first grade when she was like three or four, uh, just because they needed to have her taken care of for a certain amount of the day. And that kind of felt like it scarred her. Um, she liked her Christian friends. She, there's a lot of things she liked. She liked ice skating and they remember, you know, good times. And she also remembers going to dances, she and her sister. Why? Because if they were going to get a Jewish husband, they had to learn to dance. Very different Lubavitch you know, situation than today. But she went to the school dances occasionally, but her father would be there standing in the middle of the room, making sure nothing untoward was going to happen. Uh, she actually graduated from high school at 16 instead of 18 because she had gone to school very young, and she left and went to New York City. So her younger sister, Diana, was also uh, a, a young girl who minded the store. When she was 15 years old, a 26-year-old woman entered and started trying to open the cash register. Diana, 15, tried to stop her and was hit over the head with a glass bottle. Now, Diana was not daunted by this. The woman ran out. Diana ran after her, screaming, stop thief and the thief was apprehended. So these were tough, tough women. Got to hand it to her. Okay. So what was going on during the time that uh, these guys were here? Let me just make sure. Oh my goodness. All right, I'm going to make this much faster. I am so sorry. I had too much here. All right, let me make this very quick. And I, I thank you for your kind attention and no one going like this, but we need to move forward. Tiferet Moshe was a congregation that was actually started in 1931 in the depths of the Depression. 
and we have the uh, articles of, conf of uh, uh, organization here. Many people signed off, including Avraham Papak. Um, and they had a rabbi, Joseph Shea, all ready to go, until they didn't. Uh, you see this, this is leaving Barry. This was uh, one year later selling out entirely household furnishings for six rooms, all modern and latest style, Rabbi Joseph Shea. And my only thing I can think, he was one of the signatories to start the congregation. He ended up, um, maybe the depression, they couldn't afford him. He came back to Barry eventually. The synagogue moved several times, always in rented facilities, and the last place was above Lash's furniture, and that's really the room where most of their activities happened. That is the building in which they were. Um, they had lots of things going on in the 30s and 40s. They had a Sunday school. They had um, lots of social events. Barry was really the center for the sisterhood. So all the women-led activities happened in Barry. They had an ark, which by the way is now at Beth Jacob. That is their ark. They had two Torahs, uh, which are now in Beth Jacob as well. Okay. Back to my mystery mezuzah. Who owned the house on Maplewood Avenue? I started looking. The first owners were people by the name of Wiley and Greta Field. I'm like, oh, come on, they're not Jewish. Wiley, like Wiley Coyote? I had never heard that. But of course, they were Jewish. Here's a picture of his, um, this is not a mugshot. This is his naturalization papers. He's, his original name was Mut Sano. He was also born, yes, in the Kovno area. He came over in 1923, and they had, he actually was the first owner of the home. Uh, Mund, Mund Satno, okay. And he came and he had a, his first wife, Tilly. They had a very um, tumultuous relationship. They had one child, they got divorced. Rumor has it that Tilly was not on the straight and narrow when it came to marriage vows. Uh, and he ended up marrying a woman by the name of Greta in 1954, and they ran Fields Jewelry Store in Barrie until Wiley's death in 1972. Now, Greta has a very sad history. Her name was Greta Zeck. She survived several concentration camps, and in this article from 1961, it is... She wanted to stay anonymous, but the story is wrenching. It's like Sophie's choice without a choice. And the thought that these two people, both really kind of damaged um, emotionally by their experiences, could come together and be such a devoted couple was always really amazing to me. Um, and, you know, they didn't have children of their own. Uh, apparently, uh, Bill Wiley's son moved with his mother, uh, the first uh, Mrs. Field, to California, and they really lost touch. So. The fact that these two people found each other and loved each other so deeply and worked together, is, is, it's, it, it really is amazing. And the thought that we stayed in the house that where they were was interesting to me. OK. So the, this was a lively congregation. But by the 1960s, both Jewish communities in Montpelier and Barrie had shrunk. And it was considered to be wise to merge. Uh, and some people who were Shomer Shabbos were left behind in Barry. The sisterhood, like I said, all of the sisterhood activities really took place in Barry. Some of those women resented uh, having to move to Montpelier, and so there were, there were contentions, as in any merger. And Barry synagogue services moved to Montpelier. This is the ark that was in the ark dedication in 1949. It was hand done. And the questions I have is, what makes a Jewish community? There was no cemetery. Everybody was buried in Burlington because the section in um, Montpelier wasn't developed until much later. Mikveh, well, there was a mikveh in Montpelier, but at least the Popox thought it was pretty not right because they went up to Burlington to get dipped. Um, there was no, I mean, there was barely Jewish education. If you really wanted your kids to have a good Jewish education, you needed to move them further out. Um, no kosher bakery. There was a constant churn of Jewish residents. There was always about, you know, 
anywhere from 10 to 30 families, but it wasn't necessarily consistent. But there was a synagogue organization, a Jewish social life, a lively sisterhood, there were services. And I think one of the things um, I walk away with is this concept of resilience. These were really resilient people. Uh, somehow they managed to make Jewish life in a very unlikely place. They managed to fit in, to some extent, in a society that was really quite foreign to them. So I am going to stop because I'm well over time, and I apologize for that, and then ask if folks might have any questions. Well, first of all, thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. <laughs> and we have some time for questions. If anyone needs to leave because of other commitments, feel free to do so. Uh, you're not chained here. And uh, also, Carol will be available after, we're, after the 10 minute or so Q&A if you have additional questions that you want to ask. So we'll start. And if you can speak closely into the mic. Hi. Um, I played basketball for Burlington High School. <laughs> and I played against Harris Yetz, mm -hmm. the grandson or son, mm -hmm. who was in those days considered a giant. He was six feet four and they won the state championship three years in a row, and he was really bright. He became either a dentist or a, or a doctor. And there was another family that I was friendly with, the Goldmans. I mm -hmm. don't know if you have it on your list. I do. And, and he was a haberdasher. Yep, yep. And uh, that's what I'm saying. They're not really forgotten. It's just the idea of this organized Jewish life that I think sort of disappeared to some extent. Thank you. Yeah, the Yetz... Uh, Six foot four, yeah, that was a giant. Oh gosh, even now. I'm five foot, I think that's a giant. Hey, I was just wondering if you knew how much 50 cents in monthly synagogue dues would, would be today, just as a comparison to it. I think that's a great thing. I have to say, the way to do that is through Rav Google. Okay, how? much, I'm literally going to do this, in 2024 was 50 cents. 50, I'm sorry, I'm going to do it because I, now I want to know. 50 cents in, let's say, 1910. Let's round it up. Round it down. Okay. Okay. $16.15 today. So multiply that by 12 and you have your monthly dues. Good deal. It's still not a bad deal, no. <clears throat> um, hello. Um, there are many things, but we don't have time that I could say. But I do want people to realize, uh, which I'm sure they do anyway, that the book that you had one of the slides, uh, so the, the history of Jews in Burlington, mm -hmm. Vermont, the Samuelson mm -hmm. book, um, if you look at that book, some of you have a copy of it probably, but it's interesting that Samuelson and Ohavi Zedek and people in Burlington um, noticed and kept track of like Barry people, Waterbury people, and I was shocked the first time I read the book to see my name in it. In other words, uh, the Rosenstrike name they recognized as a Jewish name and I was in politics, so they, I mean, I didn't know them at all, but they figured that I was a Jew, and I was like one of the first Jews elected. In other words, they, to the legislature, they mm -hmm. made track, they kept track of all that kind of stuff, and it's in the book. I just think it's fascinating. And Barry, of course, way back was the most diverse city in the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't think of Burlington as the most, but Barry was the most diverse. Oh, very much so. Oh, okay. Carol, you nailed this. I mean, from, from you nailed this right here. Oh, from, thank up, you. From, from right to up that portion where you have to stop. I would be individually really interested in having you, again, I don't know if any, you know, what the rest of the congregation, but 
having you come back and finish this because yeah, I, I'm sorry is, about that. No, 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 because you've answered a lot of questions. Me being from Barry, that I didn't know, and I would really like to hear the rest of this at some time. Okay. Um, but thank you so much for you know for really helping me to understand where I where I came from, and just wanted to let you know that. Thank you, Alan. I really appreciate your time and help too. Hang on, Jewish boxer that I ever knew that fought in the Golden Gloves. <laughs> when I had hair. <laughs> Hang on a second. I was just talking to a friend of mine from Barry, who, my age, seventy-ish, and um, she, her home was right next to a Jewish home, but she was talking about the business called Needleman's, which is now here, but she was talking about they were the family that owned the, the store in Barry, and then they, whether they, they ended the store there and moved on, but I was just thinking, you know, an interest. Oh, they did, okay. I, that was just an interesting thing that I found out today. So. It was, there, we, there were some folks who owned businesses in Barrie and lived in Rutland, lived in Montpelier. You know, Barrie, I guess, was a tougher place to be Jewish. Maybe just a few more families sometimes made all the difference. Well, okay. Hang, hang. Just wait, wait, a, wait a second. I just want to mention one thing about Alan being the only Jewish boxer at the time. Uh, his grandmother was so upset with him being a nice Jewish boy that she ended up going to the boxing match with me and watching it. Oh. Well, I do have to mention, because Alan, you told me this, that uh, Alan uh, was very friendly with uh, an Italian gentleman who he said was very much like his second father. And uh, he taught him hunting. And I think this has to be a more unusual bar mitzvah gift. He got a shotgun for his bar mitzvah. I think the man he was talking about had a Howard Johnson. Yes. He was a customer of ours. My bar mitzvah was at Howard Johnson. I remember. It was great. Okay, Judy. Um, I just want to say that um, I did live in Barrie and, um, and uh, had children there and my, my, one of my sons was born in the Barrie City Hospital before it closed um, to make way for Central Vermont Medical Center. But I want to say that I did not experience any anti-Semitism um, when I lived in Barrie. And maybe that's because there were people from all, from several different countries, and it was a diverse city. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the reason or not, but um, I personally didn't experience anti-Semitism in Barry. Oh, I'd like and, to um, speak the, to that. And what you mentioned, the only thing I would say that you didn't tell the whole story is that wallpaper store. And there was a murder there. It wasn't just tumultuous, but there was a murder at the paint and wallpaper store in Barrie. Um, in other words, that I heard about this because when I moved, it was the first rural area I had ever lived in. And I did ask um, my neighbor, you know, is there any law, but you know, murders here or what happens here? Or I also asked, are there any blacks here? and so on. I mean, you know, I asked several questions, but I heard right away that about the murder in the paint and wallpaper store. Well, let's get Alan's, since Alan was an owner of the paint and wallpaper course, store. But it was a carpet store. A carpet yes, store, not that yeah. store. Yeah, I'm not trying to... to I'm no, no, no. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about anti-Semitism because I did pull some things together. Um, I... When I mention the concept of microaggression, that's mostly the level. So let me give you a couple of things. In 1905, one of the acts that came to the Barry Opera House was a show called Ikey and Aby. 
And it was a musical, one can only imagine. The reviews were not good, but this was the vaudeville of the time. So imagine being a Jewish resident and having people talk about that great show, Ike and Abe, oh, that was great. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, there were uh, good memories. Uh, Abraham Serkin, who was uh, born in Barrie in 1914, remembers how girls going on a hayride would wait for his sister until Havdalah, until the three stars were out, and then they'd all take their hayride together. So he remembers the wagons filled with hay at the end of the street, just waiting for the three stars. Um, now, of course, this is early days, and this is when everybody kept kosher, uh, everybody pretty much, well, except for, this, except for Harry Siegel, was Shomer Shabbos. Um, you know, that was sort of the weight of the group. Uh, now, there's a book called The Fiery Crosses in the Green Mountains, and Barry was one of the centers of the Ku Klux Klan activities, but there was only one incident. And that was where a man and his son had stayed with a family who were affiliated with the Ku Klux Klan as a social group. The man was the stepson of a Jewish man, not even a blood relation, and had been adopted. But he himself wasn't Jewish, but he had a Jewish last name. And this was all said anonymously to the writer. So I don't know who it was. But apparently they got threatened by somebody from the Klan saying, you can't have those people in your house. And the woman said, that minute I decided I was going to leave the Klan. And then she also talked about the kindness of uh, the furniture store, uh, the Fishman furniture store, and that the owners actually gave her more time to pay for something. So that was the big extent. Uh, the Klan, I'm sure, created problems, but it was not in a, in a huge way. Um, there's another story that relates to the Eagle family that I won't have time to tell you. Uh, there was apparently a black ball of uh, Will Bill Field from joining the Barry Elks Club, um, and that was later. Uh, and then there was the Hyman story. So the couple, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hyman, again, store owners, got a call. This was in 1945. Where is your daughter, Bessie? I'm sorry, no, they had a call, do you have a daughter? Do you have a daughter? Finally, Mrs. Hyman, who picked up the phone, this was eight o'clock in the evening, said, yes, I have a daughter, Bessie. You'll never see her again. Was this anti-Semitism? Was this just somebody playing a prank? It was a young male voice. They never found out who. Of course, the father went down because she had been out shopping in downtown Barry. went, tried to find her, couldn't find her. They called the police, finally, uh, they left messages at every possible store. She got the messages. She came home. Finally, the father called home, found out his daughter had returned, and came back. Who knows? Who knows if it was anti-Semitism? So you have these little moments that are not good. But overall, you don't have anything sustained in terms of violence, in terms of anything, in terms of the synagogue. Uh, so it was just maybe under the surface. One other quick story, two people, a Romanian man and his wife moved from New York City to start a farm in Berlin Corners, which is right outside of Barrie. And she said that when they moved up in 1947, they were accused of being communists because they were Jewish. And this was the Red Scare time, especially in the 50s. So how did she handle that? She made sure that every Grange meeting, every Farmer of America meeting was held at her house. And the woman who had started the rumors, who was of German extraction, who was a neighboring farmer, ended up being one of her best friends. So there were stuff, but there are ways of dealing with it. So on that note, I think we're going to conclude. Yes, and please. thank you again for a really fascinating presentation. <laughs> and Wish you all a good rest of the spring and summer and see you at lunch and learn next September. <laughs>